Although not well known until recently in the U.S., Lord Monckton's writings have made it across the pond in the past. In the late 1980s, he published an article in a right-wing U.S. magazine, The American Spectator, outlining his proposed solution to the AIDS problem. Every member of the population should be blood tested every month to detect the presence of antibodies against the disease, and all those found to be infected with the virus should be isolated compulsorily, immediately, and permanently. There are occasions when it is imperative to think the unthinkable and then do the undoable. The AIDS epidemic is one such occasion. Perhaps because he does not receive the respect he feels he deserves in his native land, Lord Monckton has continued to seek attention in the Americas and create the impression that he himself is a member of the UK Parliament, although he has never been. In recent testimony before Congress, he began, I bring fraternal greetings from the Mother of Parliaments to the Congress of your athletic democracy. In a letter to U.S. Senators Rockefeller and Snow, he referred to himself as a member of the upper house of the United Kingdom legislature. On many of his publications, he imprints a logo that is very similar to the symbol of the UK Parliament, a portcullis topped with a crown. His lordship's only innovation is the unique pink and gold color scheme. The symbol appears bizarrely on almost every slide in his public presentation. But of course, eccentricity doesn't matter if he's right about the science. The eccentric English gentleman is part of a time-honored British tradition, a tradition as revered as the Ministry of Silly Walks. Lord Monckton recently cited ancient glacial rocks from the Flinders Range in Australia to argue that CO2 can have little effect on climate. We can tell from the magnetic signatures of the rocks around there that the, this glacier was at the equator. We can also tell something else about the atmosphere at that time. Dolomitic rock is composed of something like 40% CO2. From that, we know that that rock was precipitated out of the ocean at this time, 750 million years ago, by a very high partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere. In fact, we can work out that that glacier existed at the equator, at sea level, at a time when there was, get this, 300,000 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And yet, there was a glacier there. So there's the first of two observations I'm going to make on why we know that CO2 doesn't have the big effect on temperature that the UN says it has. A global glaciation event, the so-called snowball Earth, is something that is likely to have happened perhaps several times in the distant past. This event, thought to have been due to a dimmer sun and changes in the position of continental plates, is discussed in a history of the planet collected by the American National Academy of Science. Volcanism would have continued through the snowball period, contributing CO2 to the atmosphere that could not be removed by rock weathering because the rocks were covered with ice. Once extreme levels of CO2 were reached, the greenhouse effect would have been strong enough to overcome the high albedo, melt the ice, and swing Earth to exceptionally warm conditions before weathering processes could catch up and remove the atmospheric CO2. So a CO2-rich atmosphere was a byproduct of the ice itself, and its warming effect was what eventually brought the Earth back to life. And there would have been nothing to stop the carbon dioxide from the volcanoes from building up over millions of years. After 10 million years without rain, the atmosphere would have been 10% carbon dioxide. Today, it is far less than 1%. The natural expectation of a prolonged global glaciation ending in extremely high levels of carbon dioxide was that you would expect these very unusual thick carbonate rocks should immediately follow the glacial deposits. Indeed, if CO2 had as little warming effect as his lordship proposes, the Earth might still be a lifeless ball of ice. 
In another accusation, Moncton cites a scientific study that he says has been deliberately misinterpreted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now this paper was written in 2005 by a satellite nerd named Pinker. He is wholly unconcerned with the global warming debate. It's as though he lives on another planet. He lives for verifying whether satellites are doing their job. That's what Pinker is all about. With a series of calculations, he purports to prove that the IPCC has deliberately ignored the study's results. The only conclusion you can come to is that they were deliberately avoiding the very clear implications of Dr. Pinker's paper. They knew perfectly well that if they took proper account of that paper, they would have to evaluate climate sensitivity as low by the remarkably simple calculation that I showed you on the screen, or something very, very close to it, and they simply funked it because they knew that if they did that and admitted that all their previous reports were wrong, they'd be out of business for, you could say, Jack Robbins. But in a recent debate, climate blogger Tim Lambert challenged this assertion with a simple question. Well, what about Dr. Pinker? What does, why hasn't Dr. Pinker spoken up and said, you haven't represented my work fairly? In an email, Lambert asked Dr. Pinker to respond to Lord Moncton's charges. In answer, Dr. Pinker, the author of the study, wrote that Lord Moncton's conclusions resulted from a misunderstanding and that our work was properly interpreted in the latest IPCC report. Thus, the evidence for a global cabal of evil scientists proposed by Lord Moncton was put to rest as quickly as you could say, Jack Robinson. But the storyline has been a consistent one in his presentations leading up to the recent Copenhagen summit. Now the apotheosis is at hand. They are about to impose a communist world government on the world. You have a president who has very strong sympathies with that point of view. He's going to sign. He'll sign anything. He's a Nobel Peace Laureate. Of course he'll sign. The Pulitzer Prize winning PolitiFact.com evaluated the conspiracy theory and pronounced it not only unsupported but preposterous, awarding his lordship the coveted Pants on Fire Award for credibility. But making incredible claims is all in a day's work for Lord Moncton. Recent press reports describe his pronouncement that NASA had crashed its own satellite in order to avoid dealing with accurate data. And now, in several interviews, Moncton is quoted announcing he has discovered a cure not only for AIDS, but for multiple sclerosis, flu, and the common cold. No more need for politically sticky concentration camps for AIDS patients. But Moncton's central claim to credibility has always been his most famous political connection. The science advisor to British Prime Minister Maggie, Margaret Thatcher. He served as a policy advisor to one of my personal heroes, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher's uh, one of his chief policy advisors. Mrs. Thatcher, of course, was scientifically trained. She had no need for science advice from a classics major. What did she think of the science of climate change? The danger of global warming is as yet unseen, but real enough for us to make changes and sacrifices so that we do not live at the expense of future generations. That prospect is a new factor in human affairs. It's comparable in its implications to the discovery of how to split the atom. Indeed, its results could be even more far-reaching. No generation has a freehold on this earth. All we have is a life tenancy with a full-repairing lease. Hold your breath. Make a wish. Count to three. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look. And you'll see into your imagination.